As the Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hits. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is a narrative story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary emotional and personal connections. Story Recap While the teen heiresses battle to find love, Cobina Wright grows more aware of her husband Bill's cheating. Nanaline Duke invests with the stockbroker Bill in order to build her own independent fortune. Now back to As the Money Burns. A small sum. There's a lot of commotion when a hundred grand goes missing, but why is that a problem for multimillionaires? Trust in love and money can be dangerous things when mixed together. Section 1 Story Flash forward, early autumn 1929, New York City. As golden leaves fall in the crisp air, opera singer Cobina Wright and the ever-ambitious Nanaling Duke leave Grand Central Station and slide into a chauffeured Rolls that takes them straight to Wright, Slade, and Company. The well-dressed ladies make their way into the prestigious high-rise office on Wall Street. It has the buzzing vibrancy of a busy stock brokerage firm during one of the best bull markets. Cobina warmly greets employees as she guides Nanaline to Bill's private office, where sits a rather plain Jane and a little dumpy secretary. Cobina requests her husband Bill while eyeing the young lady suspiciously. The secretary alerts her that he is in a meeting, will be a bit longer, and offers both ladies coffee. Could this really be the pretty young secretary with whom Bill played house while Cabina was gone? Since the summer's end and their quick jaunt to Byritz, Bill has been attentively at Cabina's side. It has been wonderful, except he is now more prone to headaches. Cabina has opted not to pursue the doubts and rumors that plague her. So much seems to have changed with the weather and seasons. Friends, too, have had other concerns. One or another has sold their roles, a yacht, or a country home all dismissed as the need to economize, fears of a market crash, or a depression. Such strange words, indeed, for the elite to utter and worry. Out of the corner of her eye, Cobina spots Bill's partner, Noel Tilton. He nods politely, and she returns, then cringes. Last year, Noel and Bill convinced her to sign a promissory note on their Long Island Sands Point home, lovingly referred to as Caso Cobina. Only recently, Cobina has finished restoring all the damage from a temporary renter while she was on tour. Why Bill rented it out at all makes absolutely no sense to her. He's done so many odd things over the last year. The ladies wait patiently, discussing various little gossip amongst their set. When Bill emerges from the office and leads a group of executives towards the elevator, his actual pretty young secretary resumes her desk, alleviating her temporary replacement. Bill ushers Cobina and Annaline into his office. There, he pours on the charm towards Nanaline as he shows her various potential portfolios. Having passed the earlier investment test with a nice little payout over the last couple of months, she is delighted to finally be in. Really in. Nanaline's eyes sparkle with dollar signs. Cobina watches them carefully, but she's thinking more about that pretty young secretary. That is likely the one the rumors keep telling her about. Cobina worries she's losing Bill, and he seems so alive when playing the stock market. To get his attention, she dabbled a bit, but that only caused problems. He didn't like his wife outshining him in his domain. Nanaline particularly likes one set of stocks, yet it requires a hefty upfront entry investment. It will take a few days to free up the funds and transfer them over. For a moment, Bill's face drops, but then flashes a great big smile. That will be fantastic. Soon you'll be making so much money in no time with this market. The other trustees will have to relent and invest for Doris too. Nanaline bristles at the mention of her daughter Doris, who has enough money. This is for her son Walker. A mother's love knows no limits. Later, Bill walks both ladies to the elevator and agrees to meet Cabina for the evening party honoring maestro Arturo Toscanini. Bill greets another set of executives, these are not nearly as pleasant as the earlier group. At their exquisite Sutton Place apartment, Cabina prepares for the party. Bill sends word that he'll be late due to an issue at the office. As she layers on the jewel, she finds little Cabina's baby tooth. With a mother's adulation, she smiles and kisses it. 
a little deer comes to her eyes, almost ruining her makeup. She digs more jewelry out and runs across, hidden in the bottom, that distasteful article about some woman suing Bill for sharing an apartment. Cobina recoils and buries it further. Now her eyes are really watering. She does her breathing exercises, transforming herself into the magnificent Madame Cobina. In her sparkling refinery and wrapped in her mind, Cobina heads off to the party with her grand opera, Diva Persona. As the evening proceeds amongst the New York Philharmonic set, another interruption sends Cobina to the door to find Bill with bloodshot eyes and disheveled. Bill stammers, I, I've, I've got to go back to the office. I just sort of wanted to make sure you were all right. Concerned and confused, Cobina immediately retrieves her wrap. Darling, I'm going with you. In the car, he doesn't speak. She rolls up the window to block the chauffeur from hearing them. Bill proceeds to mutter about missing 90 some odd thousand dollars. Banks going to shut them down in the morning? It doesn't make any sense. They make it to Wall Street, where all the buildings are dark and quiet. Inside the all-lit-up Wright Slating Company building, men rush about the corridors like a busy trading floor day. Around a large conference table, ten men pour over books and debate options and possibilities. Counting, cursing, swearing, sweating. The accountant Burns has been over the ledgers, endlessly going through the columns and crunching numbers. Cobina makes her way into Bill's private office and waits. She sees the pretty secretary flitting about, pouring coffee. Cobina pulls off her earring and picks up the phone. As the time passes by, Bill comes to check on her. Cobina informs him that two banker friends will loan them the money before the 10 a.m. deadline. Bill sighs a big relief, but then shakes his head. They still need to know how that money went missing. She strokes his head as he leans into her. The men work furiously into the night. Cobina and Bill hold hands in silence. His anguish is palpable. Cobina wonders why such a fuss over a mere hundred thousand. Surely they could transfer the money from one of their private accounts. She spent more on furniture during her last shopping spree for their new set-in-place home. Suddenly, they hear a yell. The frazzled Burns runs to the door and points out the mistakes. The bank. The bank made recording errors. Here, 7250 And here, 31000 And here they dropped the zero and marked 1950 instead of 19500 Bill looks confused. That's not half the amount necessary. Burns smiles. Ah, that's because we have to reverse the first two charges and add them back properly. That gives us 96000 Bill grabs the ledger, looking at the dog-eared pages. He looks at Burns. Burns nods. It sinks in. Bill throws his arm in the air in celebration. He kisses the top of Cabina's head. He goes out and thanks all the men for their dedication and hard work. He picks up the pretty secretary and spins her in the air. From afar, Cabina watches the celebration still confused. All this over a missing hundred thousand? Later in the car returning home, Bill is talking fast, excitedly, exhilarated, and energized. Exhausted and frustrated from all the chaos, Cobina begins to sob. Bill wraps his arms around her and strokes her head. Comforting her, he dismisses the whole scenario as part of business. He soothes. Don't worry your pretty little head. There's a mild panic on. Everybody is nervous. I'll take care of us, and everything will right itself shortly. To herself, Cobina has so many more questions. A panic? After such a great and glorious summer, especially on the stock market? Exactly how bad could that get? Yes, economically they should be fine. Bill is excellent at business. Only for her heart? That isn't so clear. For now, she proved her worth as a devoted wife. Would that be enough to keep him from straying again? End of flash forward, back to Newport, summer 1929. It's another society function. Cobina nurses her drink as she watches Bill flirt with another lady. Love is in the air, but not in the right direction. Section 2, History and Historiography Opera singer Cobina Wright is married to Man of the Floor stockbroker William May Wright. Her blonde, curly-haired husband is a Newport blue blood and golden boy. They make a dashing couple everywhere they went, and Cobina hosts the most fabulous parties, the most infamous being their circus ball every January. 
When Kobina throws a party, everyone wants to come. Kobina loves her life. It is nonstop decorating new homes, occasional special opera performances, and a few parties a year. Their Sands Point home in Long Island is complete with a mini house and mini rolls for their curly-headed tot, Little Kobina Jr. By 1929, Kobina finishes decorating their new Sutton Place apartment, a location they were tipped about during her special Maurice Ravel party where Hall Johnson and his choir performed. To set up her home, she would head over to Europe and pick out furniture, a Venetian bed, a 16th century fountain, 18-foot-long refectory table, her decor featured in the House and Garden magazines for others to imitate. Her last shopping excursion happened in the fall of 1928. Bill was supposed to accompany her, but at the last minute needed to stay behind and watch the market, something it never needed before. Disappointed, she was joined by the infamous Fanny Rice, the inspiration behind Funny Girl, with her two kids, and Duchess Fernanda de Villarosa with her son Bobby Goulet. Without their menfolk, the women made the trip about the kids when not shopping and decorating. Little Cabina played on the beach with the Queen of Greece's children. Later, Little Cabina would be associated as a former paramour to the Queen's nephew, the future Prince Philip of England, the Duke of Edinburgh, and husband to reigning Queen Elizabeth II. Only if all of life was that simple and sweet. Before Cabina left on her excursion, she started hearing the rumors. Bill had other women. Not one, but plural. She thought that couldn't be possible. It must be a mistake, a misunderstanding, mere rumor and scandal. They were so happy and perfect. She closed her eyes and left for her trip. She hoped when she returned, he would be done with his fling. A momentary indiscretion rectified. Instead, rumors hit her everywhere, and even more greeted her when she returned. While she was gone, he was playing house with his secretary. Her friends warned her to consider her price in case of a divorce, but Cabina was committed to making the marriage work. Otter, he rented out their bayfront Long Island home, Sands Point, which they affectionately referred to as Casa Cabina with its peach pink stucco. Previously, Bill and his new partner, Noel Tilton, convinced Cabina to sign over a promissory note on the property related to some business transaction at Wright, Slade & Company. Cabina adored the home and was unwilling to sign anything that could risk it. Only Bill's melancholy and withdrawal eventually forced her to yield. During her European shopping excursion, the home was trashed due to the over-partying renter. This was not a time when rich people rented things, especially not their homes. This isn't Airbnb. The place was torn up with several expensive items missing. This was a lavishly set up house with an adjacent mini replica for their tiny tot. So many guests delighted in staying there, including Noel Coward. From a concerned friend, Cobina got an article from the cheaper rag newspaper, Graphic, covering a lawsuit by another woman suing Bill for maintenance of 20000 after sharing an apartment. When Cobina confronted Bill, he scoffed that it was blackmail for a failed stock endeavor. He righteously scolded that Cobina should know better after eight years of a happy marriage. Even worse came the rumor that one of her friends was having an affair with Bill. Now Cobina is not sure whom to trust. After her 1929 annual circus ball, for which Swiss composer Arthur Honegger was the featured guest of honor, Cobina opted to join his Pro Musica tour. Established in the early 1920s, Pro Musica Society was originally called the Franco-American Music Society by pianist E. Richard Smith. The goal was to give rising European composers and performers a chance to appear to American audiences. By 1925, there were over 20 chapters and a quarterly publication. It is the same organization that Maurice Ravel toured in the Harlem Renaissance episode 11, A Tall Order, and the same party where Bill and Cabina learned of a new building development to be known as Sutton Place. Honegger praised Cabina's rare talent and ability to sing both classic and modern music. Bill encouraged the tour as it would be a great distraction while the necessary repairs were made to Casa Cabina and as the remaining construction at Sutton Place finished up. Her brief return to the concert circuit also met with favorable press. In one article, she was praised as having four careers, wife, hostess, millinery hat shop operator, and concert performer. She also was an occasional newspaper columnist on music and society. This is a woman capable of doing anything. In many ways, she did way more than that, always having a little calamity from here or there. Near Chicago, Cabina lost her jewelry case. But it wasn't her diamond bracelet or other jewelry that upset her. 
It was the missing baby's tooth she was carrying with her. During another part of the trek, they had to stop the train, afraid Kobina was thrown off into the mountains, only to find Kobina under her furs, sleeping in the wrong car. On the tour, she was greeted by Charlie Chaplin in Hollywood. In reverse, Chaplin was her guest of honor at the opening of Set in Place. Now back to her regular life, Kobina is bound and determined to make her husband see the value in the relationship. She's tried getting his attention by playing the stock market, and surprise, surprise, she does quite well. Only, he seems to resent it more. As long as she plays the dutiful wife, she fares a little better. But even their own daughter alerted her about daddy kissing the nanny. What is Kobina to do? She's so consumed with his cheating that she neglects other pending signs of doom. That mere paltry sum of 100000 in 1929, adjusted for inflation, would be the equivalent of $1.5 million today. They were so conspicuously wealthy and were often aiding others in setting up new businesses. So why is there so much concern and worry over such a small amount? Seems trivial. But is it? I warned in the beginning there is so much to cover that not everything will be told chronologically. There will be flashbacks and flash forwards from time to time always tied to the present time within our story. This is a small skip ahead to remind not all is what it seems in the world of money and love, especially in 1929. Section 3, Contemporary and Personal Relevance All relationships have their difficulties. We can get blindsided by so many things, things we fear, things we can't comprehend, things we wish were different. It can get so bad that we go into a deep pattern of denial. Always using rose-colored glasses, even decades later, Kobina spoke about Bill with love, not anger, not bitterness, only the sweet memories of their lost fairy tale. Who wouldn't want to hold on to the glamour and grandeur of a love and life like theirs? But fairy tales always involve nightmares, and hers has only begun. On the surface, everything is good as it always was, Only those pesky and persistent rumors make it clear something is wrong. Actually, she's focused on the wrong thing, thus becoming blind to a far bigger danger. Isn't it ironic what we fear or dread? In reverse of the grass is always greener, once in the middle of a crisis, we wish we could switch it to something different. When we're being gaslit or dealing with an unknown, we somehow imagine it as something bad, but still fixable. Then only to be confronted with something completely different. I have said this is a story built out of my broken heart and broken dreams. My parallel journey started as a teen with her first romance in Rhode Island and even with two days in Newport. But the real hard one came over a decade later in another relationship. A marriage filled with passion and compatibility of my dreams and came with its counter opposite, a complete nightmare. I had always feared someone cheating on me, understandable after the end of my parents' marriage. In the end, I was wishing that was the underlying problem wishing that would be my way out. I knew there was a secret I didn't understand, but my rationale always thought it was surmountable. I was not prepared for the truth. It was like being thrown into Alice in Wonderland or an episode of The Twilight Zone. Or maybe it was the escape from such an ending madness. All that didn't make sense finally had more clarity, and with that came pain. In the end, heartbreak is heartbreak, but the truth can set you free. If you're enjoying this world and want to see more, come check out my two webinars on the original Waldorf Astoria Hotels, pre-1929, Thursday, November 19th, and 1931 and later, Thursday, December 3rd, both at 5.30 Eastern, 4.30 Central, and 2.30 Pacific at New York Adventure Club, www.nyadventureclub.com, live with one week recorded access afterwards, only $10 each. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, another prince comes to visit with his heir's wife. In a world where young heiresses dream of romantic love, this couple is the epitome of relationship goals. Only will his presence cause problems for the current reigning royal? Until then. As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Woodard based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As The Money Burns at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com.